Hey everyone, welcome to this Three Kingdoms podcast. I'm very excited. Uh, it's going to be a bunch of sections here, but let me go ahead and kind of paint you the broad brush overview. So first, the purpose is going to be to introduce you, the audience, to the Three Kingdoms period. And we're going to have different sections to do this. So the first section is going to be to discuss the popularity of the Three Kingdoms period. Uh, the second is going to be to discuss the historical context of the era. The third is going to be to discuss the romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. And then the final section is going to be to bring it all together and pivot from history and legend over to gameplay and see how it's translated into CA's uh, product here. Uh, so I'm going to have two speakers with us today, uh, John Zhu, who is the host of the Three Kingdoms podcast, and then Peter Stewart, who is a writer for Creative Assembly. Uh, and now I'm going to allow them to do their introductions uh, before we get started. So John, I'll start with you. Maybe you can give us a brief intro of uh, kind of what your background is. Thanks, Julian, for uh, having me on. So uh, yeah, so I'm John Zhu. Uh, I created the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast uh, back in 2014. Uh, and that uh, wrapped up in uh, May of 2018. Uh, that is a side gig. Uh, in my day job, I do communications and public relations. And before that, I was a uh, journalist by trade. So uh, the podcast has uh, given me a uh, opportunity to kind of flex some of the storytelling muscles uh, from that uh, aspect of my career. Great. And then Peter, how about you? Sure. Yeah. My hi. Julian, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. And I have been working at Crib Assembly for about six years now, five years of that being a writer. The last couple of years, two years, 18 months, about that time working on Three Kingdoms. Before that, uh, I am an English graduate, so I sort of naturally fell into the, the writing. Uh, and I've always loved Total War games and history, um, so it seemed like a natural fit. I almost did a history degree and then pulled away at this the last second. Um, and so I somehow managed to convince Crib Assembly to make my my part-time sort of hobby and my joy, my actual job. Um, and I'm still here somehow. All right. Well, they're going to be assisting me going through uh, this whole podcast, and I'm so eager to have them on board. I know John, um, both Peter and I have listened to your podcast. A lot of people over at Creative Assembly have, so huge props to what you've done. Uh, you're part of the reason why I'm sure there's enthusiasm over at CA for covering this period uh, and why I'm so confident kind of going into this that it's going to be awesome. Uh, so yeah, props to you, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll get started now. So the the first section, as I said, was going to be to discuss broadly the popularity of the Three Kingdoms period. Um, like I said, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast is trying to introduce audiences to the period who may not be familiar with it. So first and foremost, what I want to get kind of out of the way is why is it so popular in the first place? Uh, in the first place, uh, so we'll be discussing kind of. Why is it popular in its, you know, area of origin? And then why is it popular further outside, you know, now in the West, um, and how it became so? So we'll start first. Um, John, maybe you could give us a context for how popular is it in the East and maybe sprinkle some anecdotes from your own life in there. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the Three Kingdoms period is extremely popular in China and throughout much of the East, uh, East Asia as well. Uh, so, you know, stories from that era, you know, began spreading through Chinese society in the 300s. So, you know, not long after the period ended. Uh, and of course, uh, the novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, was written about a thousand years later. And that really worked wonders for uh, the popularity of the period. And, you know, in um, modern times, it has uh, sparked numerous TV shows, uh, movies. Uh, and, you know, I remember one of my f uh, fondest memories about the period um, or experiencing the period is uh, growing up in China, uh, we had st uh, storytellers on the radio and every day uh, at lunchtime, you know, this guy will come on the radio and just start telling uh, the stories um, from the r novel and, you know, they are master storytellers. And, you know, this was a time before everybody had television and things like that. So, uh, you know, everybody kind of, you know, stopped whatever they were doing around lunchtime and tuned in to listen to these guys, you know, just tell these classic tales. Uh, and that was a really strong memory for me. And that was partly what prompted me to uh, start a podcast about the novel. Uh, and, you know, in terms of cultural impact and significance, I would put... Um, the you know, Three Kingdoms um, period and the novel that came from it on par with uh, you know, Shakespeare in the West as far as you know, its uh, 
impact on Western culture and society. Yeah, and that's that's one comparison I've heard just to kind of help Westerners understand. Another comparison I've heard is to to try and compare it to like the Homeric epics, um, kind of all of them yeah. wrapped into one. Um, and, and that's a big thing. And I've also actually noticed uh, as well just how infused it is with kind of the Eastern culture. I've been doing some business trips over to not China, but Vietnam uh, next door. And I've been seeing Three Kingdoms stuff like everywhere. Now that I know kind of what to look for, it's everywhere. Uh, you'll see it in like advertisements almost. Um, if I go into a bookstore, they always have uh, like manga or different um, stories about it. You can always find it referenced. Uh, I've even found it um, in the in the states. If you go into certain restaurants, I think it's like Thai restaurants or other restaurants. Sometimes you'll see little um, figurines of Three Kingdoms warriors. I think particularly it's like Zhang Fei. I think he became uh, kind of a, a religious figure. Um, uh, yep. So. And Guan Yu is a religious figure as well. Uh, you know, he's kind of worshipped as the uh, god of war um, and also as a symbol of honor. So you will find a lot of Guan Yu statues uh, throughout Asia. Yeah, so I would, I would recommend anyone who's going to uh, eat at one of those restaurants, keep your eye out for one of these characters. Uh, you, may, you may end up spotting them. And that's, that was something that I had never really known before until I started to look at the history. And I was like, oh, my God, it's really uh, everywhere. Um, so that's that's kind of John's given us a bit of context for the East, uh, and from there it's kind of bled out into the West. Um, so I think uh, CA is doing their part to make it known in the West, but it has kind of spread out prior to that. Um, so maybe now we can pivot on to discussing how it went to the West. Uh, so I did a little bit of research on why, or kind of the history of how it bled out to the West. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about kind of the research I found, and then maybe we can talk about my own experiences uh, learning about the Three Kingdoms period, uh, and then Peter as well. So real quickly for my research, what I found is that the popularity in the West is largely driven by the romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. Uh, and then that novel kind of spread out and the stories spread out, as John said, from China to the surrounding region. Uh, literature was spreading for many centuries in the East, uh, and one of the places that it did definitely take hold in kind of fertile soil was in uh, pre-modern Japan. And in particular, these stories rang true, like the, the stories of different warlords competing and the stratagems and the, the backstabbing and the, the fighting and all this stuff um, really rang true with what Japan was going through during its own warring states period. Uh, and so they found a lot of parallels and kind of incorporated into their stories. And so the Three Kingdoms period um, became popular in Japan during the modern period. And that's where it gets infused in media and entertainment. Um, so, you know, games, TV shows, manga and all that. And that, you know, gets exported a lot to the West. So uh, a lot of us were exposed to it kind of through the Japanese take on it, uh, things like Dynasty Warriors and other games. And that's how, uh, you know, I've kind of heard of the Three Kingdoms characters before was through Dynasty Warriors. There's increasingly TV shows that you have access to in the West. Uh, and then, John, your podcast was one of the ways that it's kind of making its way over to us. Um, so, Peter, perhaps you can talk about um, how you've run into it in the West? Sure. Uh, I don't think my uh, experience varies terribly different from yours, at least in, an, in its earliest form. What I knew was Dynasty Warriors, for sure. Uh, when I was way younger, like half a lifetime ago, it was like, oh, Dynasty Warriors, like three, and now there's like 12. Um, I was... Yeah, I would play it. It was really fun, but it didn't super spur me to to look wider than that. Later on, uh, the other Koei games, like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms games, I was like, oh, this is really dense. This is really interesting. As I got more interested in history, uh, I started to hook into it more and more. And I think uh, the, a big breakthrough sort of not a video game kind of thing was Red Cliff the film. Mm. Um, was the first it pushed west. Um, in two parts, and that was when I was first like, because it was John Woo, John Woo movies are always really stylized and really epic and really excellent, uh, and they introduced you to all these characters, this slice of the Three Kingdoms period, uh, and that was the moment, I think, for me at least, when it was like, yeah, this is a really excellent, interesting period of history, um, and that we need to engage with it better, and I need to engage with it more. Uh, and then it sort of lay dormant for a bit until we started working on the game itself a few years ago, but then when that started, it was like, I need to relive all of these moments as well as reading the actual The Romance of the Three Kingdoms itself, which I'd never done. Um, so that's how I sort of found the, the period. Yeah, and like we keep saying, I mean, this game coming out is definitely bringing it again in another wave uh, to the West, and hopefully the fallout of it will mean more interest and uh, a lot more attention on the period, which I think deserves a lot of attention. There's so much richness that it brings to, to the East. I think the West could benefit from it. 
Uh, but uh, it does require an introduction, and that's that's where this podcast comes in, and <laughs> that's where John's podcast comes in uh, to help people get acclimated to the to the period. Uh, so speaking of getting people acclimated to the period, we're going to move to our our next section, which is going to be talking about the historical context for the era. So. I'm planning my own kind of documentary on uh, the historical context for the era. But what I found myself doing is going back all the way to the start of kind of Chinese history uh, <laughs> and then following all the oh, okay. dynasties <laughs> leading to that. That's not what we're going to do today. Um, but the, the main theme that and this is how kind of the Three Kingdoms novel starts is basically China or the, the region of China always has kind of this coming together and tearing apart cyclical nature. Um, uh, of the dynasties rising and falling and the three kingdoms period kind of falls at uh, the end of one dynasty and the start of another uh, set of dynasties. Um, so maybe, Peter, I think we were going to cue you up here to talk about what was the fall at this point um, and walk us through kind of the precursor to, um, yeah, the, this next cycle. Okay, sure. So as a brief sort of context setting for the way dynasties worked in at least in the Han Dynasty and the dynasty before it, um, the the emperor had what was known as the Mandate of Heaven, which was it's like it's analogous to our divine right of kings, except the divine right of kings gives the king the authority from God, and no man can change that. The Mandate of Heaven can be lost and gained depending on signs interpreted throughout the land. So a famine, or a natural disaster, or any kind of uh, terrible thing that happens is is interpreted as an act of uh, displeasure from the gods so in the precursor to the yellow turban rebellion in 184 there had been a famine there had been uh like hurricanes and terrible blights inflicted on the populace which a lot of people saw as the mandate of heaven passing from their hand and the time of the azure sky as the yellow turbans called it to to end and the yellow sky to rise uh, so in 184, a massive peasant revolt called the Yellow Turban Rebellion started, um, and it was just about put down. Like, um, it, it, well, it didn't quite win, but it shook the hand to its foundations. Um, and then people arose from this situation, so like Dong Zhuo made a name for himself, as did Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Chang Fei, the three brothers who swore their oath in the Peach Garden in the novel. Uh, those three characters started to become recognized, as did other characters as well. But when that was over, these warlords had the power, but they saw also that they thought the hand might be ending as well, particularly Dong Zhuo. He was unimpressed with the way he'd been treated. He was unimpressed with the way that uh, the Han had led and dealt with the rebellion. And so he sort of kept his distance and sort of bided his time and watched. Uh, and then Emperor Ling died. Uh, and when Emperor Ling died, uh, the Han dynasty descended into a massive power struggle between the Ten Eunuchs, who were a, a really overly powerful, corrupted power block, uh, and the, the general-in-chief, He Jin, who wanted to keep order, but it didn't work. So he organized a plot to bring Dong Zhuo, Yuan Shao, and other generals outside of Luoyang, the capital, to sort of quell the eunuchs and make them do what they want. But instead, the eunuchs killed He Jin, uh, and which led to the generals, including Dong Zhuo, storming Luoyang and taking, like, killing every single eunuch that they found, or anyone that looked like a eunuch. Um, but Dong Zhuo... Um, in the chaos, then took control of the Emperor Xian, uh, Xiao rather, and um, then essentially he wouldn't give him back, <laughs> uh, and sort of started to control him. So all of the other generals formed a coalition against him, um, called the Guangdong Coalition, led by Yuan Shao, but secretly controlled by Cao Cao, uh, and then they marched against him, which ultimately caused him to burn Luoyang to the ground and flee west with the Emperor to Chang'an, and that is essentially where we start the collapse of the Han Dynasty and the beginning of the rise of the Three Kingdoms. And for those familiar with kind of Roman history, the dilemma you have here is, okay, there's this rebellion. Uh, the central power has a hard time dealing with it. So what they do is they try and empower maybe the local regions, uh, give the generals more power, allow them to raise arms. But like what happens with the Roman Empire, the second you empower your generals, then they're going to want a piece of the, the empire. Maybe they'll help you deal with the threat now, but then all of a sudden they don't want to stand down. Uh, and then you have a period where now all these warlords uh, want to take power. And that's kind of similar to what you see with the Roman Empire. The second you start to give power to these generals and you hand control to kind of the lower level, they're not going to want to hand it back. Uh, and that's essentially what you have in this period. And what follows is kind of a squabbling between then these power brokers with the emperor really on the sidelines, no longer having the power. Um, uh, and so, John, maybe you can walk us through what happens from here on and then maybe the formation up, up to the formation of the formal three kingdoms. Yeah, 
so um, as you guys mentioned, uh, Dong Zhuo took power, uh, and that was around the year 190. Um, and you know he was uh, a rather tyrannical prime minister. Uh, and as Pete mentioned, that prompted uh, other warlords to uh, form a coalition against him. Uh, that coalition did not succeed in dislodging him, but then uh, in 192, uh, Dong Zhuo was assassinated uh, by uh, court officials uh, who conspired with one of his uh, most trusted uh, generals, uh, Lü Bu. And his death uh, basically opened up a huge power vacuum again, and that led to years of fighting among the various warlords for control of various parts of the empire. And that pretty much went on for about 15 years before um, all these factions uh, were eventually uh, absorbed into uh, several major uh, power bases. Uh, so uh, one of those major power bases uh, was um, the Sun family, who established themselves in the southeastern part of the empire, which is around uh, the Yangtze River. And uh, so they started their rise in the, one, in the late 190s, and by the early 200s, they had pretty much established themselves as the rulers of the southeastern portion. Uh, and then in the north, uh, that took a little longer to come together, but by about 207, uh, the north was united under uh, Cao Cao, who basically became prime minister of uh, the Han dynasty. Uh, and you know, again, uh, using the emperor as his puppet by this point, uh, he defeated uh, numerous uh, warlords in the north. His biggest rival was Yuan Shao, who was actually the most feared warlord of the time because he had the largest army. But Cao Cao, in a series of battles, uh, routed Yuan Shao, uh, even though he was greatly outnumbered. And that uh, set Cao Cao on the path to controlling the north. So um, in 207, uh, so he had controlled the north. And then the next year, he began to try to march south and conquer the south as well, which would reunite the empire. And at that point, Cao Cao was looking pretty unstoppable. But uh, in the south, he ran into problems. Um, the um, Sun family in the southeast, uh, who had uh, controlled the state of Wu, basically uh, eastern Wu, um, they formed a coalition with uh, Liu Bei, who was this uh, down-on-his-luck general who had bounced around the empire for decades and you know, had basically nothing to his name and had gotten on the wrong side of Cao Cao because he was part of a conspiracy to assassinate Cao Cao. And when that conspiracy was exposed, everyone else was executed, but Liu Bei managed to escape. And now Cao Cao was coming south and Liu Bei was hiding in the south. So Liu Bei was running. And he uh, reached out to um, the House of Sun, which was uh, led by Sun Quan at this time. And they decided to form a coalition. And this coalition took on Cao Cao at a place called Red Cliff. And the battle there um, t basically uh, turned the tide of history. Uh, so Cao Cao came down looking invincible, but then uh, thanks in part to pestilence that ravaged his army, and thanks also in part to the strategy of uh, Sun Quan and Liu Bei, uh, he was defeated. And that set him back. He had to retreat back to the north, and he never really again came close to conquering the south. Uh, so instead of the empire being reunited at that point, uh, we now had um, separate power bases, one in the north and one in the southeast, and then in the five years or so, five or six years after that battle at Red Cliff, Liu Bei began to establish himself. Uh, he branched out into the southwestern portion of the empire and conquered those territories. And so he set himself up as a third power base. And that uh, pretty much sets us up for the three kingdoms. Um, and you know, they, there was uh, constant warfare between those three power centers uh, for years. And then in 220, uh, this is after Cao Cao had died, his son um, assumed his position as prime minister, but then his son decided that he wanted to be emperor. So um, Cao Cao's son, who was named Cao Pi, um, forced the Han emperor to abdicate and yield the throne to him. And that ended the Han dynasty. And 
uh, Cao Pi founded the Kingdom of Wei. And when that happened, uh, that prompted Liu Bei in the southwest to say, no, the House of Han didn't end because I'm a member of the imperial house. So I'm going to uh, establish my own kingdom here and call it the Shu Han. Um, and I am the legitimate continuation of the Han Dynasty. So he declared himself emperor as well. And then um, a little, about, I think, a few years after that, um, uh, Sun Quan in the southeast, uh, who had, for all intents and purposes, uh, had been you know, acting like an emperor um, up to this point, uh, just basically say, okay, you know, I'm now an emperor as well. So that's when you have three kingdoms. Uh, and so that was in the 220s, and that's when the Three Kingdom period officially began. Awesome. Yeah, and then we'll stop it there. There could be a lot more to, to cover in the future, and if you're interested in that history, uh, John has a great podcast on kind of the details of the Three Kingdoms period, and then um, I'm sure we'll be doing follow-up documentaries on the before and after. But yeah, thanks guys for helping us put this in the historical context. Um, so the next thing I wanted to do is kind of pivot over to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel, which takes place kind of in the meat of this. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it covers kind of where Peter left off to, which is kind of Dong Zhuo coming to power. Uh, it starts there and then it kind of ends with the formation of those three kingdoms. Is that correct? Uh, actually, it starts uh, with the Yellow Turban Rebellion, basically. Um, it, goes a l it starts off like about 10 years before the Yellow Turban Rebellion. But the, it really starts with the rebellion, uh, and then you know, followed by Dong Zhuo's rise, and it goes all the way to the end of the Three Kingdoms period when the empire is actually reunited. Okay, all right. So yeah, very all-encompassing. So we've given you a broad overview of kind of what that was historically, uh, and then now, like I said, we'll pivot over to the the novel, and this is kind of the legendary side of these affairs. Um, so Peter, I, I think we'll start with you, and you can tell us, you know, what is this book? So, the actual Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the, the book written by uh, Lo Song, is, yeah, like you said, written about a thousand years after the actual period. But it is like a collation of all of the oral traditions, the oral stories, operas, poems, songs that, like, and of course the actual history, the records of the Three Kingdoms itself, brought together into one sort of encompassing narrative that goes from, like you said, the beginning all the way from the Elturban Rebellion right to the end when Sima Yi deposes the, the Kingdom of Wei uh, and starts the Jing Dynasty, or, or essentially lays the groundwork for the Jing Dynasty. Um, but it was revised a bunch of times. Um, so it's the version that we know now is from about uh, about the 1660s um, when Mao Lun and Mao Zongang sort of re-edited it a little bit and added some of the more famous parts that we didn't that we attribute to it, so like the the opening line, the um, the empire long divided must unite. This is thus it had always been, uh, and those kind of things are added later, as are quite interestingly removed a lot of references to how Cao Cao is a good person because they didn't like him. Uh, the the low de scholars have a lot of debate about that, but it does seem like a lot of stuff is redacted because of a certain bias. Um, but essentially, yeah, it takes the stories of the history. Uh, and sort of paints them in a very dramatic light and adds a few things like the oath in the peach garden, which we have no real reason to believe ever happened. Um, and certain sort of traits and some people are made more dramatic. So South Cyber becomes more wily and nefarious. Liu Bei becomes more honorable and chivalrous and noble. But it generally follows the path of the history all the way through to the end of the Three Kingdoms period. Um, and it became so popular, uh, like John has said, so popular and so ingrained in Chinese and East Asian culture that in some ways they almost, the history and the romance are almost indistinguishable from one another. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, growing up in China, we actually you know, learned about the period through the novel first. Um, you know, it's, all, it's almost kind of like, okay, you know, this is kind of, you grew up reading the novel and you think, oh, this is um, what happened. And then when you actually read the history books, you go, oh, wait a second. No, that's, you know, <laughs> Cao Cao was actually, you know, not as uh, you know nefarious as he was made out to be, and Liu Bei's character is not as um, 
pristine as it may have been in the novel. That's that's you know, no Lube, he can be a bit of a <laughs> he can be a bit bit nefarious himself. That's yeah. the thing oh, I yeah, love about absolutely. his character. A lot of people in the the Total War subreddit are kind of like poking fun at him, how he's always like this do-gooder guy, but in actuality, you follow his events, he's always on the backside of some conspiracy, going around dancing around, <laughs> yeah. forming the other coalition in opposition to his former lord. So yeah, it's you can kind of see yeah. through the bias and say like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> Yeah, because right. I've always said that, like, obviously every story needs a good guy, so they say they, they protagonist is Lu Bei, but when you look at it in sort of the context, Cao Cao was kind of the good guy. He was just a bit Machiavellian about it. Um, and my, my favorite little anecdote, just before we jump into the next section, is when um, is when he literally says in his deathbed to Cao Pi, he says, don't make me an emperor, and don't claim the emperorship for yourself, and also don't put me in a big, massive tomb that <laughs> deifies me, because... I don't want that. Well, our work isn't done yet. The minute he dies, so he says, All right, he was the emperor. I'm the emperor. Put him in a huge tomb so everyone knows how cool the emperor is. And then goes from there and it's like, come on, dude. <laughs> well, great. Well, that pivots us over to, uh, we kind of staged the novel itself there and put into context why there may be biases in it. And so, yeah, two things to take away from that is like, okay, the book was written long after the period itself. Um, it's a accumulation of kind of oral traditions where you have these storytellers who kind of recount the stories and that in and of itself you know molds how the story is told you get these characters who take on legendary proportions because it, it owes itself more to uh you know the oral traditions kind of the same way the homeric epics kind of drive up these characters fit them into different tropes and themes and stuff so it kind of twists and distorts the story and then on top of that you have kind of the biases and the redactions trying to uh to favor or disfavor certain characters uh, or lineages down the line um, so that's kind of the book. Um, and now we can talk maybe about kind of our experiences with the book. What are our, what are our favorite stories and characters from the novel? Um, so I think we'll, we'll rope in everyone for this. Um, John will rely primarily on you to relate your favorite things. But maybe I can start with uh, my favorite parts from the book and then Peter's. Um, yeah. um, so I'll, I'll start with me, like I said. So in terms of the book, I've read um, most of book one. It's It's a long it covers a lot of history with a lot of detail. So book one, I've basically gotten up until uh, the the death of Dong Zhuo. So still not that much has happened. Uh, but from there, I've picked up a fair amount of manga online and I've been reading along with that. I've listened to part of the podcast. So I've gotten dabblings of the story here and there, but uh, in no way have I gotten the complete history. Uh, but thus far, what I've enjoyed the most is actually kind of the stratagems. Uh, I, I really like that aspect to it. Um, I always like stratagems in history, clever ploys that different people have used. Um, so people have probably heard of these stratagems before but one of my favorite ones is you have two armies fighting i think on either side of a river uh one side starts to run low on arrows and their stratagem to replenish their arrows is to fake uh, an assault across the river send out some boats with some dummy soldiers i think straw filled soldiers they put armor on the on the straw bales or whatever to make it look like it's soldiers the other side thinks that it's the army invading they fire all their arrows into the ships and then the other side quickly reels back in the ships and collects the arrows. Uh, so that's kind of my favorite aspect of the, the novel is that you have all these clever little stratagems uh, in there. And it's almost in every facet of the novel. It's not just a stratagem for replenishing your arrows, but also maybe um, you know, how to undercut your enemy. So the way that they cause the downfall of Dong Zhou uh, and is by kind of splitting him and Lu Bu together by using a, a woman between them. And that's part of the stratagem. So there's all this stuff in there. And that's kind of my favorite aspect of it. Um, and I think um, John and I were discussing possibly doing a, a series highlighting these various stratagems, uh, but I'll pass it on to Peter now. Uh, yeah, I feel like I accidentally revealed one of my favorite moments just a second ago by accident, but I have others, so it's okay. Um, one area that I really like that has actually tied into the game a bit, which I'll talk about a bit later on, is just looking, like observing how the coalition, or the Guangdong coalition, sort of didn't work and almost didn't work from like the very start. So you have uh, Sun Sun Zhen like being really cool, being the tiger of Jiangdong, charging in, uh, being really cool and killing everyone, and being the, one of the few people in the coalition that gets any victories. Um, and then he's defeated because he asks Yuan Shu um, for, for for aid for like supplies for his army. Uh, and Yuan Shu, who doesn't want Sun Zhen to get all the credit because he secretly wants to be emperor, or not so secretly wants to be emperor, denies him any supplies and they're on the same side it should be said this to be like pointed out uh and so essentially sun jen nearly dies uh and gets surrounded and has chased off into the mountains and has to flee all because yuan shu is incredibly petty and just doesn't want anyone to have the glory when he thinks that he should have it um 
and there's someone like someone later on someone like has talked about the novel and saying that it's the nature of the hu- of human ambition and that particular moment and the coalition in general just encapsulates to me just how flawed that is <laughs> and how silly the whole situation seems but to them it's life and death and that's kind of yeah throughout the novel like like i said the stratagems but also just how humans uh, interact there's a lot that you can learn even though some of it is legendary but there's a lot you can learn about it's basically a thousands of different situations where you have different um power levels different things going on and it's almost like a treatise it's almost like the art of war but extended over like politics espionage all kinds of things uh, and so you can understand why the japanese and others looked at it like oh we can learn a lot from this and study it and learn you know derive formulas for how to deal with life but overall it deals with all kinds of themes um that are that are very important i think that's why it has the lasting impact and we're all kind of drawing different parts from it um but let's pivot over to to john i guess and maybe you can share some of your favorite stories or characters yeah and i uh, just to close the loop on uh, that last thought uh you know i think there's a whole college industry of uh, business strategy books you know based on lessons from the three kingdoms um <laughs> uh, yeah but so um one of my favorite anecdotes uh is uh, kind of almost just like throwaway story that has no, no real impact on any major s- events in the story, but it just shows kind of um, adds to Tao Tao's nefarious depiction in the novel, and you know, uh, and it just kind of shows how the novel, you know, just goes about um, almost you know character assassination in a way. So the story goes that you know Tao Tao was on campaign and his army was running low on provisions. Uh, he knows that backup provisions are coming, but it's not going to get there for a couple of days. Uh, he just needs to figure out some way to, you know, basically make whatever little grain he has left uh, last, you know, for a couple extra days. Uh, so he uh, calls in the granary officer and tells him to basically cut the men's rations. And the granary officer is like, well, we do that. The men are going to be up in arms and you're going to have a riot in your own camp. Tao Tao was like, that's okay, just go ahead and cut the rations. If, you know, something happens, I'll take care of it. So the granary officer goes and cuts the rations, and, of course, the men proceed to start rioting and, you know, get all up in arms. So the granary officer comes running to Tao Tao and says, the men are up in arms. And Tao Tao's like, okay, I'll deal with it. I need to uh, borrow something from you to help me deal with it, though. Granary officer is like, okay, sure, whatever you need. Tao Tao's like, I need your head. <laughs> and and the granary officer was like, what? And so I was like, well, you know, somebody has to, you know, be responsible for um, embezzling grain, basically. <laughs> you, you need a scapegoat. So the granary officer was like, well, you told me to do this. I was like, I know I did. And, you know, after you die, I will take good care of your family. And Toto has the guy dragged outside, beheaded, and his head hung up, you know, on on the uh, at the gate to the camp with a big announcement saying that, you know, so-and-so was embezzling grain and, you know, he has been punished. And that was enough to subdue the men for the time being. And that gave Cao Cao what he needed to make the grain last without his army disintegrating. Oh, so man. it's just one of those delicious little stories that just you know, <laughs> get, adds to the whole Machiavellian character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's such a good one, because you know as well that he, like, that kind of feeds directly into his character. Like, he's doing all the wrong things for all the right reasons. Um, like, he's a real, real jerk, but in the end, he's like, well, this will get me ultimate victory, so I, sh- I should probably do this. Right, yeah, I mean, he ends up being, you know, a big winner in the yeah. novel and in the time pe- in the his in the history period. Yeah, he quote-unquote yeah. wins, essentially. Yeah. Like, yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want me to Go talk about some other, some more. Um, yeah, I mean, we let's touch on maybe if you have one or two more favorites, and then we can get on to the the next section. But go ahead. Sure. Um, and then you know to go to the kind of the other extreme to show how the novel glorifies Liu Bei's character as this uh, you know wise, compassionate lord who uh, you know everybody is just willing to you know run through a wall for uh, because he's so wise and compassionate. Um, so Liu Bei, as I mentioned earlier, you know, was um, on Cao Cao's bad side for having tried to assassinate him. So when Cao Cao was marching south, Liu Bei was running, um, the, and he was uh, running with, I think, tens of thousands of civilians, 
from the region that he was um, you know overseeing, and so you know, with that big an entourage, he could only move you know very slowly, and Cao Cao's army was catching up to him quickly. So some of his advisors told him, you know, you should ditch the civilians and just go on ahead to safety. And Liu Bei refused to do that. And he said that, you know, these people, you know, have decided to throw in their lot with me. And, you know, if you're going to try to accomplish anything, you can't do it without the support of the people. So I, you know, I can't leave them behind. Uh, and, you know, as the, in the novel, you know, when the civilians heard this, you know, everybody broke down in tears and <laughs> whatnot. And of course, you know, uh, because they were traveling at a snail's pace, uh, Cao Cao's army caught up to him soon enough and scattered everybody. And Liu Bei was separated from his two wives and uh, his infant son. And uh, one of the great stories in the novel comes when uh, one of Liu Bei's top generals, Zhao Yun, uh, you know, courageously rides through um, Cao Cao's entire army, basically, um, Protect with uh, Liu Bei's infant son strapped to his chest, uh, you know, saving the infant and bringing him to safety and delivering him to Liu Bei. And Liu Bei, upon seeing this, you know, was so moved and you know he had no way to thank Zhao Yun to express his gratitude that he he decided to show um, show his gratitude by throwing the child, throwing the baby onto the ground and saying saying. You know, because of this little, uh, you know, child, it almost cost me one of my top generals, and you know that made Zhao Yun, you know, forever grateful and loyal to Liu Bei. But of course, if you read the story, you just go, wait, but you know, Zhao Yun just fought through an entire army to bring you this baby, and you almost just killed this baby by throwing <laughs> him on the ground. <laughs> but yeah, but so you know, just things like that that you could really show, you know, the way the novel paints these characters to um, you know, hold them up to be um, you know, stand-ins for uh, certain ideas. You know, Cao Cao is the nefarious Machiavellian you know, um, courtier, and Liu Bei is the ups, upright, you know, um, uncorruptible, um, compassionate, Confucian lord. You know, so it's just very interesting to read that with a uh, more critical eye. Yeah, that that section, that's essentially the beginning of the movie Redcliffe as well, isn't it? When Zhao Yun st- uh, saves the baby and brings it back to him. Um, I don't yeah. think he throws it on the ground in that version. <laughs> yeah, that would be weird. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for closing the loop on that. Um, and, um, yeah, there's tons more stories in there. And every time someone... You, uh, there's no wonder there's like a whole cottage industry for relaying these stories or interpreting them in certain ways. There's so much to the the period and the novel and everything. It's It's amazing. Um, so uh, this will kind of pivot us over to section four, which is going to be, okay, how do you take all of this, both the history and the legends from the, this novel, and how do you condense it down and turn it into gameplay? Uh, so this will be mostly Peter walking us through kind of broadly what are CEA's plans to boil it down into gameplay. Uh, so maybe, Peter, maybe you can walk us through that. Sure. Well, it's... Um... Definitely a big undertaking, and a Total War game is a is a big game, so fortunately there's a lot of room for us to maneuver through the history and through the romance like that. Um, but on a top level, sort of ideologically speaking, we wanted to create the atmosphere and the feel and the sort of the tone of the Three Kingdoms period and of the novel. Even in either mode, either in romance or historical mode, you are like feeling like you're in that sort of painted world, almost. Um, and although like hindsight is definitely... 2020 when it comes to looking at history one thing we wanted to push forward that feeds through the characters and through the diplomacy and the way that you interact with other factions and other warlords is the idea of you're not quite sure who to trust um because through the history and obviously sides swap people make alliances people break alliances in the blink of an eye there's even like a moment after the battle of red cliff uh where jiga liang is talking and he's like well we're friends today but we'll almost certainly be enemies again tomorrow or in a week. Like, you have territory that we want. We have territory that you want. We will end up going back to war over it. And he's like, yeah, probably. So see you on the battlefield. Um, but this all feeds through the game as well, like the espionage system as well. 
you can send characters into enemy factions and they will essentially become generals or administrators, governors, um, even faction heirs if they do well enough. And then at a key moment, you can sort of say, okay, now do this for me. Uh, and then they will change, they will turn the tide and maybe destroy a faction through infighting. Um, so there's a certain level of paranoia through the whole period that we noticed and distrust we wanted to feed through as well. But on a less granular level, I think one of the big points is certainly the characters, as we've talked about quite a lot, is that this period is driven hugely by its characters. Um, and so we had to represent them as the most important part of your faction as the driving force. So they lead all your armies, they go into positions of power in your government, they uh, make and break alliances. You are dealing with the character more than you are dealing with the faction. So if Liu Bei is in charge of his faction, then you are dealing with someone honorable, you might get a bonus to your diplomacy because of that. Whereas if Liu Bei is, dies or is deposed for whatever reason and someone else becomes the leader of that faction, you might treat them differently or you might have different penalties and different buffs depending on on what that is. Um, so that really drives the, the focus in the way we haven't looked at before and the way that we definitely think that the novel and the history defines itself. And uh, These characters also... Sorry, go on. Well, sorry, I was going to say, kind of what I've noticed from what you've shown is you know, in the past, yeah, we've had focus on characters and kind of rewards for doing things and you kind of you, you kind of skill up your certain character. And yeah, maybe that's been done before in Warhammer. But I think one of the novel things is what you've done is kind of stitched it together with it's the relationships with other people. It's not just leveling yourself up or doing your actions and having consequences on just yourself. It has consequences on on the web of other people you interact with, which is like yeah, you're saying the, true uh, to the period. Yeah, the Guanxi mechanic, I think. Yeah, the Guanxi system is uh, actually in one of my playthroughs right now is messing me up. Is because I have all these armies out in the field. I'm doing quite well. I'm maybe like 60, 70 turns into the campaign, uh, and then there's been a few incidents or just a few deteriorations, and now I'm getting messages saying this person doesn't like working with this person, but they're in the same army together in a really good army that I don't want to break up. So I'm like, what do I do? Because now they they don't like each other, but if it gets too bad, they'll take their army and rebel, essentially, and leave and go to a different faction. So managing that that system of interlocking relationships is really important. Um, because like you say, in the novel, people make and break friendships um, and all the time, and this affects standing armies. The whole situation later on, like when the Three Kingdoms are arising, is when the Kingdom of Wu is sort of like buying, not quite buying out armies, but sort of convincing armies from Shu Han to sort of defect and then defect back and it's just it's all crazy and confusing and that is sort of represented on slightly less chaotic scale but managing those relationships is really important to a successful faction um, and also the armies are, the armies themselves are driven through the characters so each character has a retinue and you can't recruit units without a character leading that particular retinue of up to six units so every to where you turn it's like well it's got to be made a, you got to make a choice for the human a character so and that's one of the things I, I did like um, the reworking of recruitment uh, I think it was very appropriate for Thrones of Britannia the way you guys implemented mustering very true to the period of how it was done uh, and looking when I first saw gameplay of this game especially you know how armies were managed I really liked it so you guys are keeping over the mustering system combining it with different retinues tied to each commander I think it works perfectly uh, and it's aligned with at least as far as what I've seen of the period itself where you have these warlords that pop up they have their soldiers loyal to them uh, and then the actual recruitment of those troops is something that's very much is tied to, to mustering it's not just instant stack of elites or whatever it takes time um, so yeah I, I really like how that's been a, tra a translation of the the realities of the period um, so I think yeah like you talked about it uh, earlier on how one of the problems in the fall of the Han dynasty was that there was no real proper standing army for the Han it relied on loyal warlords to raise their own local troops to go to war for them um, by mustering them from their their counties and their commanderies. Um, and then you've got the problem is like, okay, well, these belong to me now. They are loyal to me. So if I swear loyalty to you, then they're loyal to you by extension. But if I don't, you know, what are you going to offer me for, for my power, essentially? Uh, and the kingdom can't stand on, or the empire can't stand on that kind of rickety foundation. Great. So we've covered the character focus and then not just the character, but broadening that to relationships. Uh, the relationships then inform kind of diplomacy and espionage between these larger uh, factions. We talk about uh, kind of army management uh, and maybe region management. So maybe you can talk us through how your take on region management in this game uh, 
mirrors the reality in, in China at this time? Sure. Well, on like a purely historical, being historically authentic as we possibly can, we've renamed what uh, provinces and regions in previous games to be uh, commanderies and counties, respectively, because they were known as commanderies and counties in the time. And a province in Han China, particularly, is a huge tract of land, which is like seven or eight, uh, approximately, provinces in Han China. And so we couldn't represent them because they're too big. They're too big to manage, and they're too big to, to sort of depict on the map. And so we went to commanderies and counties, um, and through a commandery, which is your central administrative hub, and your counties, which is stuff like mines, farms, paddocks, that kind of stuff, ports. Uh, so the outlying resources that you need to effectively govern and effectively wage war. Commanderies deal with uh, population influx is a, a new factor because in the period, a lot of people were migrating from the rural areas as a result of the famines that had plagued the land. Rural areas to urban, from rural areas to urban areas um, and so you see population rise and population rise affects your public order and affects your food consumption and food consumption another like hot topic issue of the time um, especially as people are pushing south and discovering all the fertile southlands and that kind of thing uh, managing the food production in, in your empire is important for the public order but also for your armies on the march uh, because if you don't have enough supplies you can't march into enemy territory for very long without them all starving to death um, so we're just representing as best we can um, how it really was, and that's not even mentioning the the standard, like administration of building buildings, researching technologies, that kind of stuff, and reforms, all that kind of stuff that is core to Total War game, but with the the history of the Three Kingdoms sort of injected into it as well. Great. So the next two comments that we had were to address kind of events and then the end game, um, at least in uh -huh. our notes. I did have a, a couple more, maybe I wanted to touch on that are uh, sure. other things that are emblematic of, I think, how the attention to detail you guys are doing. Uh, so the first for yep. me is the duels between characters. Those are huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the from what I've read in book one of the, the romance, it's nothing but duels <laughs> before every clash of armies. <laughs> it's the duels and sometimes that decides the battle. So I'm glad you guys have duels in there. Um, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and then the other thing that's hugely important, I think, just for the overall feel of the period is the, the music uh, from what we've seen in the trailers. I know everyone's been very impressed by that as well. Sure. The music is actually incredible. Like not just in the trailers, I've been listening to it a lot recently, obviously in, in my like in depth long long form playthroughs for the for feedback and that kind of stuff. And it's just it's just so good. It's so good. I it's no real way of me quantifying it because it's music. Um but it's excellent. So that kind of that feeling through the trailers that you've really loved is continued into the game in the same way. It's just uh it really adds like you say, it kicks it up a notch, it really picks that whole thing apart. And jewels, jewels are really cool. Only in the, like the romance mode because that's where that whole thing comes from like i talked about earlier guan yu um killing people and like chopping someone's head off and going back to sit down before his his wine got cold uh that kind of stuff is represented in like the the wuja combat from more well, modern adaptations from john woo films from the mangas that kind of stuff uh is how we do it and mechanically the jewels have an impact so like if you're outnumbered but say if you have guan yu with you or if you have uh lebu with you instead then you send them into a duel uh, against a heavily like outnumbered force, uh, and you kill their general, that could help you tip the tide of battle in your favor and cause like a rout because their general has been uh, disemboweled by by an angry god of war. So, yeah, those two factors, those all come together, and the duels particularly are really, really beautiful to watch, um, especially when the music's going on in the background as well. So it all works together. Awesome. Well, let's touch on those other two points, and then I want to circle back to. Um, something else as well. Um, so let's touch on events and then maybe end game. So the events, yeah. can you let us know how kind of key events from the history or from the romance are represented in the game? Sure. We have a like a bevy of events that are uh, um, sort of like conjured up in our own minds as well as having historical facts or romance accurate facts as well. So we've drawn things that did happen and made adjacent events as well, which I can't really name because there's so many of them through the game, but there's a couple of direct examples from like factual history and romance that I can talk about. Uh, in historical terms, for most factions that are to nearby, but particularly for uh, people like Liu Bei and Cao Cao, is in the first few turns of your campaign, you will get a what we call the Tao Shan event. So Tao Shan um, was a warlord who was between Liu Bei and Cao Cao at what we would call the beginning of the game and around 190. Um, and Cao Cao's father, Cao Song, went into um, 
his territory and was ambushed. And whether or not it was accidental, we don't know. But he was executed. He was killed. So Cao Cao goes to war with Tao Shan. Um, and Tao Shan draws Liu Bei into the war with him. Uh, and you get that event saying Cao Cao's father has been killed as Liu Bei. Cao Cao's father has been killed. What do you want to do? And the choice that you make decides whether you end up at war with Cao Cao or whether you really, 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 really make Tao Shan unhappy. And on Cao Cao's side, you get a similar event. Like, do you want to go to war to avenge? Or do you want to not go to war? And then you'll look like a fool and make everyone really unhappy, but you won't be at war with someone this early in the game. So those kind of events drive uh, that early game for those two. And on the romance side of things, we have the Dao Shan events. This is only in the romance mode. But essentially, the Dao Shan event will pop if you're playing as the now newly revealed Dong Zhou. Um, and it will decide whether or not and you can choose it yourself as Dong Zhuo. You get the choice whether or not you go through with the sort of the intrigue of the Daoshan um, sort of storyline. And if you do, then Dong Zhuo ends up dying and Lu Bu becomes the uh, the leader of his faction. Uh, and that's for you to decide. If you want Lu Bu to be in charge of the faction, then you want to follow that through. But if you prefer to be Dong Zhuo, then you might not follow it through the way it, the way it did. And in each case, we we tell you this is what actually happened. Like, so this is what happened in the history. This is what happened in the romance. So you can tailor your choice around how you want to play. I see. Okay, that's cool. Um, so these will happen over the course of the game, and then it'll give you kind of rewards one way or the other, or have pretty substantive uh, impacts on your campaign. Yeah, both of those ones I, exa- I mentioned happen relatively early on. The Tao Shan event happens very early on, and the, the Tao Shan uh, event happens later, but still within the first... So I'd say in the early game, because um, you can make a choice of how you want to tailor your playstyle. Is there any event tied to kind of the Emperor being bandied about? Like who controls him now or where he is? <laughs> so if you start with Dong Zhuo, you start off with Emperor Shan in your control at Chang'an. And he's denoted by like a, like a pin on the map. You can see him. Uh, he's not a character at that point, but you can see him. Uh, he's like a, but he can be obtained. So owning him owns the Han Dynasty, what's left of the Han Empire on the map, which is all over the place. They don't become yours, they become a vassal of yours, and so they pay tribute to you. Um, and you can essentially just wander around their territory uh, freely. If you manage to get to Chang'an and take the Emperor as anybody else, um, then you get the Han, essentially. Um, and this goes on until there's no Han left or until three kingdoms have arisen. Um, and then at that point, the Emperor ceases to be because he's not the Emperor anymore. Um, and he may or may not end up on the map as a character, just wandering around, doing his own thing. But um, he, he certainly he stops having the power of the of the hand because the hand is gone. So how does that work then? Is it kind of like it's something tied to the settlement or is it tied to an army? And whoever defeats the army, it's now tied to that army and someone can beat that army up? Like, how does it kind of move around? I can't remember where he goes after you take him from Chang'an. Um, I think he stays in Chang'an if you have him there, but I'm not sure if you can move him. I haven't actually successfully taken the Emperor in any of my playthroughs because he vanishes before I can get to the actual Chang'an. But I know for a fact when you conquer Chang'an and he can't be moved from Chang'an, once you take Chang'an, you've got him. Whether you can then shift him to your capital, I'm not sure. But as long as you hold Chang'an for, sure, for certain, you hold the Emperor. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's cool how that works. Um, and I know you guys have certain... Um, like, like Liu Bei and I think others have things built into their, their character which is they're an inheritor to the Han I think or something like that where when you try and conquer a Han province you have the like the assimilate option which is a new option where yeah, they, yeah. they basically just bow to you and open their gates yeah so each uh, each of the of the warlords the starting warlords has a unique they have both a unique uh, faction resource and they have a unique sort of uh, ability to do certain things uh, and Liu Bei is, is as you say he can annex Han territory Without a fight, he just kind of assimilates it into his empire uh, and gets all of its strength because he is, like you say, he's of the imperial family. Um, that's a more that's one of the more direct ones, actually. That's really um, kind of direct. You go, oh, I want this now, I want this now, I want this now, under the pretense of saving the Han from from Dong Zhuo's tyranny. But then someone like Dong Zhuo has intimidate, where you can just brute force people in diplomacy to doing what you want. And Cao Cao has manipulate, where he can literally affect the diplomatic standing between two other factions without getting involved himself. And he can also start wars between two factions if he has enough of this resource um, without having to get involved himself. So yeah, everything is tailored to the, the particular character, but Liu Bei, as you say, um, just chases the Han around, essentially. Okay. 
Great. So let's pivot now to maybe the end game. So in previous Total War titles, you guys have had different takes on it. Sometimes it's like Realm Divide, where all of a sudden you get so powerful, everyone turns against you. Or maybe it's a big invading army or waves of armies that come in. Uh, or maybe it's climate change that kind of makes public order and all that stuff go crazier and crazier. Uh, so, so what's the end game mechanic here in Three Kingdoms? The end game of Three Kingdoms is Three Kingdoms, essentially. Um, you spend the whole game building up your prestige, uh, they're getting more and more powerful, getting greater and greater ranks. So Duke to Marquis to second Marquis. Uh, not well, you don't start a Duke, that would be silly. But then when you get to Duke, you become a Duchy. So your whole your whole faction changes from so like Lubei's faction or Ren Shao's faction becomes a Duchy of Song uh, or the King of the Duchy of Wei if you're South South, for instance. Uh, and then that's when you're starting to push through, and everyone's starting to realize that you've got more power. And then when you push past Duke and you become a king is when you also declare yourself to be one of, like you declare yourself for the throne. Um, so you get to king and you become the kingdom of Wei, the kingdom of Song, the kingdom of Wu, etc. Uh, and you declare yourself emperor. And your capital city becomes what we again call an imperial seat of power. Uh, and when you declare, two other factions will declare at the same time. The two other strongest factions on the board become the two other kingdoms. And then three emperors are made. Uh, and then you have the three kingdoms period. And the objective here is to not to destroy every single thing from every single one of them, because that would take you forever, uh, is to is to essentially get it to their capital and take their seat of power, and you win by having all three of their seat, all three seats of power from all three uh, emperors on the board, uh, so to speak. And we did that because we think it, it brings down the, like you say, the realm divide sort of a mash a bit, where everyone's just suddenly against you. Because what you'll find is your alliances and your vassals from your playthrough uh, will sort of, choose where they lie and a lot of them if they like you they'll just join up with you and amalgamate with you and be part of your be part of your empire uh, your kingdom and then that will happen across until you'll get three quite big power blocks hopefully quite evenly spaced out power blocks and then essentially you just duke it out until you have all three emperor seats very cool okay yeah james had talked to me a little bit about this before so essentially you get to the certain threshold of power boom now it, uh if you try and declare yourself um then it splits into three between the, mm -hmm. it just pulls who are the biggest powers after you. So the top three, and I think what I was told is all the other powers kind of below those top three are then, I don't know if they're forced to or if they're encouraged to by some mechanic, but they kind of will have to choose a side, which then makes these huge three grand coalitions. Um, so, yeah, so you, well, we have the mechanic called the, the Heavenly Alliance, which is essentially where you reach out to your, your vassals and your military alliance, and you said, look, I, I have the mandate, I think I have the mandate of heaven. Um, and I'm going to go and fight these guys to take their seats and prove that I am the rightful uh, inheritor of either the Han or the rightful successor to the Han. Um, and then they kind of go, yeah, okay. Or they go, mm, okay. They usually say okay because you're quite powerful at that point. But if they don't, then obviously, like you say, they choose a side. But ultimately, when the pieces fall, everyone will belong to one of the, not belong, will, will have allied and aligned themselves with one of the three big groups. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a, the fresh take on it. And I like how you guys are uh, acknowledging the fact that you don't have to completely demolish all the other two kingdoms. There's a more a straight path to make uh, for taking the. When capitals. you look at the actual history itself, it's not quite how it happens. Like that's that you don't have to go around and I conquered every single town and every single village in this one of the largest countries in the world. Like, uh, did we take the very end of the Three Kingdoms period when the Kingdom of Wei becomes the Jin Dynasty? It's like the Jin Dynasty wasn't really there just Sima Zhang sort of just kicked over the emperor, like the king of Wei, and just said, okay, we're not the Wei anymore, we're the Jin Dynasty. So it's not quite as always as comprehensive as being really thorough and taking every territory. It's about the choices you make and when you make them and taking strategic points, essentially. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking this so far. So we've enumerated all the ways, I think, that it, it does try and parallel history or draw from the legends, which is so far great. Um, one of the main things that I maybe wanted to touch on before we wrap up here is the game is going to ship with two versions inside of it. There's the Romance and the Records version. Uh, we've heard a lot about Romance, um, not so much about Records. And I think one of the fears in the community that the, the, the Romance is the focus and then the Records is simply going to be same thing as the Romance, but just you, you strip away features and then that becomes the history. Um, in a... I don't want you to like, you know, maybe you, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by saying, you know, that's essentially what it is, but could you give us a sense of kind of the approach of how it's, it's shaping uh, out? Sure. 
Uh, I don't think saying stripping away features is uh, entirely fair. Not to, like, I'm not being antagonistic, but just, I don't think it's. I thought that implies a bit too heavy-handed an approach than we're taking. Uh, there are certain certain bits that are in romance that are not in uh, the classic mode or the historical mode, but they are the same game. So you won't have duels because that kind of larger-than-life John Woo sort of uh, effect is entirely romantic, entirely in the romance, and so your generals will be not as powerful, not as larger than life. They will have a pivotal role in battle, but they will have a like a like a retinue, not a retinue, uh, a bodyguard unit, so there'll be a bunch of cavalrymen with you as the general. So you can use I would use them like I do in other games for like a tactical flank or whatever, but I wouldn't ever, for instance, use them like I would <laughs> in romance mode, sending them head first because they'll just get slaughtered. Uh, and then beyond that some other events are shifted so like the Dao Chan event like I said doesn't occur uh, and other things that are drawn from the romance like that don't occur but it's not something that will have a massive quantitative effect or qualitative effect on your game like you say like it's just a different way of playing it ultimately it's the same game with some visual tweaks as well like so the armor might not be as uh, uh, what's the word might not be as sort of grandiose on some characters because it's more rooted in history than it is in romance but ultimately it's the, it's the same game. <laughs> yeah, so there aren't any new features that are solely for history that have been like, you know... No big features, no huge features that we feel would... Because that would create a disparity and that wouldn't be fair to people who want that more rooted experience, that more rooted Total War experience, which we're, we really want to give to people. Uh, but also, we obviously couldn't... We talked about it a million times today already, that the romance and the history, uh, particularly in Asian East Asian culture, are so intertwined. We couldn't not do both modes and we couldn't not give romance it's just desserts because ultimately most of us i would say it's fair to say that i think romance mode is more fun but we also appreciate that we are a historical total war game yeah to like dealing with history so we gotta do that as well yeah because it's only fair and just to, to preempt i think people's reactions i think i, I think yeah I'm, I'm more on your side on this i think the way people are seeing it is like oh you've got all this stuff for romance and then for history, you're just stripping away features, and what you should do, and they'll, they'll say, what you should do instead is, if, if you're taking away features, you have to add unique features. But the way I see it is like you guys have added, like, it, going if you're going to build a game, going from the romance down to history is obviously going to have to take away aspects. You know, you have to take away the duels, you have to take away certain extra things, or you have to tamp them down. Whereas if you were to build anything from history. There is no reason you couldn't take that new feature and then make it available and enrich the legendary version. It kind of like sure. nests inside of it. So that's how I'm seeing it. Is like, guys, why would they take something away and then make something unique to history? The history is being built up, but it just translates over and creates the game that's the basis for the legends. Um, yeah, I don't think it. there's anything like we've, we've talked about before. There's nothing like the romance follows the rough grain of the Three Kingdoms period with mm -hmm. some embellishments. It's like, it's just adding and nothing like this. Like, jewels are really cool and can really help in a battle, but some people might not like that the heroes have that much power. So we're giving them the historical mode where they can focus more on the original Total War strategies like that. So I wouldn't say at all that it's to do with adding or removing features. It's just a shifting of certain focuses, um, which is, and pe I, like, people will get joy out of both versions, I feel. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. Um, is, is there anything kind of when you guys are, are tuning the settings to make them seem more historic, like have battles changed significantly in the way they're played? Oh, do you mean across the course of development? Um, no, I mean like in terms of battles where in one... Oh, between the two in modes? One ver yeah, between the modes. So in one version, you have to balance out the fact that, hey, there are these super basically got, got demigods running around the battlefield and therefore you have to balance the armies as a result versus, okay, now it's just all standard humans. The balancing is different? Is Is it... You... Well, I think you're, uh, I think in the early days of development, we did realize pretty quickly that we had overpowered the heroes, mm. um, and that they were just like Sauron at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. He was just sweeping his arm, and like hundreds of men were going absolutely flying, and we were like, mm, that might be a bit too much. We thought, um, so we powered it back, and I don't know exactly because I'm not a battle designer um, the, between the two different modes whether the balancing is different, but I think the units are all roughly the same balance. It's just how the heroes affect that. Um, so you'll still be doing in both modes your sort of your maneuvering with your units, your cavalry charges, your flanking, uh, your spear walls, your arches, all that kind of stuff. The whole sort of meta of how you move around your retinues and your ground troops will be the same. 
And then over the top of it, you're like, how can I employ this incredibly powerful large in life general? Do I want him to go into a duel with someone else or want to stay nearby so he can buff my my units? Do I want her to go over there so she can start giving formations to some of my units? Um, but So it's just like a layer over the top rather than changing how the units work on a, on a granular level. Okay, cool. Understood. Well, yeah, thank you. So I think we've covered uh, a ton now from what makes the Three Kingdoms period popular, then discussing the history, then the novel, and now get down to gameplay. Uh, so that's a whole lot to absorb. So thank you, both of you, for sticking around for uh, the duration. Thanks for all the you know the listeners for sticking out to here. Uh, and at this point, the way I wanted to close is to offer up some resources for people to learn more. Um, and one of the prime resources that I did want to plug is going to be uh, John here as a resource. Um, he runs the Three Kingdoms podcast. So maybe, John, you can tell us, uh, tell the audience more about how they can learn about the Three Kingdoms period through you and maybe um, other projects you're working on. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, the Three Kingdoms podcast, um, you can find it at threekingdomspodcast.com. That's spelled with uh, number three. Uh, so that's a podcast that started in 2014 and finished up in 2018. And in it, I retell the story of the romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, in English. And I try to do it in a way that's uh, accessible to people who are not familiar with Chinese culture and history. So uh, I will take time out uh, from the narrative uh, and explain uh, cultural references or historical references because there are tons of them in the novel. And if you don't know what they're talking about, then you have no idea why that particular reference you know, matters in the context of the story. Uh, so I take time out to do that and also uh, create supplemental episodes uh, exploring various aspects. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I have um, you know, episodes looking at the um, historical realities of um, some of the major characters uh, versus how they are portrayed in the novel. Uh, and then for each episode, I also create uh, supplemental material like uh, the transcript, uh, maps uh, of the regions uh, discussed in that episode, and also a list of the characters and you know, who they are allied with, uh, who, or who they serve just to help you keep track of all the things that are going on in the novel. Uh, so yeah, um, and so like I guess I finished that podcast in 2018, so I took a six month break, and then uh, now I'm working on another podcast, uh, kind of along the same vein, uh, on another great uh, Chinese classical literature uh, novel, um, The Water Margin, uh, which is very different in nature from The Three Kingdoms, but I think uh, just as good, just as interesting. Uh, it's about a bunch of outlaws uh, running around uh, in 11th century China or 12th century China. And uh, if you are interested in checking that out, it's at outlawsofthemarsh.com. So, um, and then uh, I have a couple of other resources for people who are interested in learning about Three Kingdoms. Um, one is... Um, Kongming.net, that's K-O-N-G-M-I-N-G dot N-E-T. Um, that is a great encyclopedia um, about the characters, the locations, and the history, um, all, all related to the Three Kingdoms and the novel. Um, and then uh, if you really, really want to delve into the history of the period, uh, a great resource is um, the writings of uh, Raph de Crespigny, who Yay. is a... Yeah, who is a uh, <laughs> You know, a prominent um, sinologist, and he has written a lot of great works about the Three Kingdoms period. Um, so just Google him. They have him or, uh, over and, at a CA. Or I don't yeah, know if he's Rafe, there. Yeah, we wouldn't have him. We wouldn't have him. Like, he's in the, <laughs> he's the emperor. No, uh, <laughs> you got him. <laughs> no, Rafe has been uh, incredible. He's like he's our, our historical consultant, and there's no one. There's probably very few people in the world who are as who are as keyed up on the Han Dynasty, the later Han Dynasty, as, as Rafe. So you are quite correct. He is quite a dude. You could bear, read some of his books. His book on South Side is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you for giving us all those notes. Um, and yeah, just to, to circle back on the Three Kingdoms podcast, I mean, it's been fantastic. I've listened to it, and I don't want to understate how important it is to have almost like a, a cultural translator in there. And 
um, yeah, it's great. The way you kind of break it down, it's very accessible. You'll you'll basically go through the passage and say, you know, you'll explain what happens, and then you'll say, so basically, you know, this, this, then this, and it's just you break it down in a very accessible way. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome. I really appreciate it. So it definitely has my seal of approval. I know from Creative Assembly side, uh, Peter and others have said they they appreciate it. Hundred percent. Yeah, because like we say. Um, it's not just the fact that you've gone so in depth on absolutely everything, which is really, really helpful, um, but also the fact that like we are dealing with a time period and a history and a culture that is not our own. So we want to make sure that we are doing it service, that we're being respectful, that we're not trading on any eggshells, and doing anything silly or anything wrong that can come with dealing with a different culture. Uh, and so the little cultural notes and the this is what this means stuff from your podcast has meant an absolutely huge amount. You and like other groups that we've talked to as well, like just making sure that we're crossing all our t's and dotting all our i's it's been perfect it's been excellent so i cannot thank you enough for yeah. existing oh thank you and you know uh, and just from the you know, comments i get from my listeners you know so many of them you know got their first exposure to the novel or uh, to this time period through um the video game franchise so i really appreciate the links that you guys are going to to you know make sure um what you're working on is historically accurate and you know, i think well, that's we do great. our best thank you very much all right. Well, thank you both. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter, uh, for joining me. Hopefully, we can do this again uh, at another time. And uh, we're both very excited for the launch of the game. And John, for your upcoming podcast series. I am excited for the Water Margin podcast. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, bye now.